Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Chicago Wilderness Cafe. My name is Laura Riley. I'm the coordinator of Chicago Wilderness Alliance, and we're going to give it a few more minutes while folks join us. You can feel free to put your name in the chat. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Just testing my uh, equipment here. I couldn't find my camera, so at least I was able to get on. Okay. I can see if I can. Hi. Well, we have a great lineup today. My name is Laura Riley. As I said, I'm the coordinator of Chicago Wilderness Alliance, and we're here with Bob Hoyer from HNA Networks Consulting, Ted Hafner, the Taking Climate Chair lead, and we are um, we're going to get started here. So, if you want to go to the next slide, Bob, I just want to say a quick thank you to. Um, the Illinois Department of, oh, well, here's how we can create a cafe. Um, if you'd like to create your own cafe, please reach out to me or on our website. We have a registration form and we can get that scheduled on our calendar and promote it and, and have a conversation like this on any topic um, related to our Chicago Wilderness Alliance Green Vision Initiative goals. Uh, next slide, please. We're really grateful to the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and the U.S. Forest Service uh, for the support that, that allows us to host these cafes because trees are important to humans health as well as to nature. Um, they support this through the urban and community forestry grant and learn more at tree city USA about how to make your community a tree city. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Bob Hoyer to get us started. Thanks, Bob. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to turn it over to Ted Hafner to get it started. Thank you, Ted. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ted Hafner. I am the lead uh, for the Taking Climate Action Initiative as part of Chicago Wilderness. Uh, thank you for coming today and good afternoon. Uh, we hope to have a, a robust discussion um, among a couple present uh, panelists and presenters. The way this is going to go is I will sort of uh, bring some context to this discussion from a, a climate standpoint. Uh, and then we have Bob Hoyer from uh, HNA Networks to uh, uh, give some more agriculturally focused context. And then uh, from there, we'll, we're hoping to launch into a, a robust discussion with Judy O'Gala, Will County Board Chair, and Maria Abney, who is a financial advisor uh, and owner operator of Farmland Fabrication and the immediate past president of the Moni Chamber of Commerce. Um, I will note that uh, Judy has some grandchildren with her, so that might be a little interesting because her, her grandchildren are sick, her kids are at work. Um, so please bear with us uh, and be patient with that because she may have one of them on her lap. Um, and also uh, to my knowledge at this point, Maria has yet to log into the session, but even if uh, these panels don't show up, I think we'll present enough information to have a really rich and robust discussion with the context that, that both Bob and I provide to you. Um, so with that, I have to move that up here and I will launch into this. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Chicago Wilderness, we're a, a partner organization of 250 plus or minus partners uh, that, that encompasses diverse members working together in a regional format uh, to promote nature and environmental uh, opportunities that connect with human health uh, for a better quality of life and uh, and for now and generations to come for both natural and human communities. And, and that's sort of a, a new focus for us, the human part, um, but th that allows us to have these rich and robust discussions that we hope to have today. 
Um, as a reference, this is our regional uh, area. We are part of Southwest Michigan, Northwest Indiana, uh, uh, Northeast Illinois, and Southwest Wisconsin. Uh, four state region, we have 10 million people on 8 million acres of, of land. Here's uh, some further context. Uh, the Ag Agriculture Group has had, uh, for two years now, really great attendance at local field days. The first one was in Kane County. And then this one last year in August was actually in Will County itself. Uh, these are some of the, the photos of some of the stops there. Um, and some of the, the tour members that participated in this in this really wonderful field day. Um, we're under discussion or they are under discussion for locations for next year. Uh, we haven't decided where yet, but um, we're, we're looking hopefully at, at uh, some partner states to, to see what's going on there. Further context, uh, in the Chicago region area, we have our Chicago wilderness area, we have about 4.5 million acres of agriculture. It is our biggest land use um, overall. Uh, protected agriculture is 1.4 uh, thousand, uh, yeah, 140,000 acres. Um, and then we've lost in the, in the Chicago wilderness region, 144,000 acres to development. Um, those are pretty uh, important concepts. I will dive into Will County specifically um, a couple slides later, but, but just keep that in mind as, as we go through this discussion. So I wanna talk about the Chicago region's history a little bit. These are a series of graphics that, that aren't great graphically, but they do serve a purpose. And I think you can understand that from 1900 to, to 2000, and, oh, sorry, 90, 1992, um, there's been a lot of expansion of Chicago, a lot of development, uh, mostly through the, the railways and the railway corridors. Um, this is older data. The only thing that I could find for more recent data is, is this video, so bear with me. I hope this works. Um, let's see, just gonna share my screen, there we go share. And this is a, a video of that development that shows by timeline sort of the, the sprawl and creep away from the Chicago city center and into the collar communities. Uh, this will take about 20 seconds, but I really want you to pay attention to the light pink that you're going to start seeing about now. This is where we get into Will County, the collar counties, and further and further afield uh, from downtown center. And you can really see the impacts of the, the development and the sprawl in, in Chicago's expansion. And this takes us to 2015, which is sort of the most recent data that we have. Uh, please bear with me while I unshare this and go back to my presentation. Uh, and there we go. There we go. Okay, share this. Um, and I have a sludge. Oh, uh, do I have to go all the way back to the beginning? I did not. I think I, gosh, where is that view? Oh, there's my view. Sorry, guys. Technological fail here. Uh, oh, just, oh, there we go. Look at that. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, there's been a lot of increase in uh, development reaching out well beyond the city center, or even Cook County, into the collar counties of Will, uh, Kendall, Kane, Lake, and, and now even starting into McHenry uh, in the Illinois side, and then also into Lake and Porter on the Indiana side. The graphic on the left is from the Chicago Wilderness Hub. That's a series of GIS maps that we have organized by initiative. So this is from the Ag Team Initiative. And what you're starting to see here is the dark brown, more solid brown is, is fairly agriculturally intensive. And you can see that creep starting to show up in Will County. Um, I, I wanna call to your attention this lower right-hand corner here, even though Will County sort of looks like it's pretty heavily 
agricultural in the large map because of the color brown. Uh, you can see in here that that it's mostly agriculture in the south, but they've lost about 50% of their agriculture to date as a county. Uh, here are some of those metrics that I referred to as a region earlier. Um, so according to the data on the Chicago Wilderness Hub, and this is also posted right below this map, um, there are 262,000 acres of agricultural land. Uh, we show zero of it as protected. Um, and then we also show 13,000 acres being lost to development. And, and these are sort of the time frames that you could see 2010 to 2013, we lost about, or the county lost about 2%, uh, a little less during 13 to 16, but then since 16 to 2019, 20, uh, there's been a lot of loss. Um, again, this is the type of agricultural practices that are on the ground uh, in terms of soil health, uh, cover crop use, uh, no-till, those kind of conservation ag practices that, that Chicago Wilderness really uh, advocates for and, and, and feels does a really good job of, of helping with some of these nature-based solutions to climate change that I will get into in a moment. Um, so now I'm gonna throw some climate metrics at you. Uh, this is also from the Chicago Wilderness Hub. This is under the climate tab. And, and really what we have here is just a, a showing of what county uh, has a per capita emissions rate of what, right? Most of us have a, a carbon footprint plus or minus uh, 12 um, million metric tons a year, uh, but, but they're actually showing that Will County in general has the highest emissions rate of the seven counties uh, in the Chicago region. Uh, and, and that average rate is quite higher than the sort of 11 to 12 that I just referred to and up at 17 uh, plus. Um, so that's that's something that should be considered here in the context of what we're going to discuss today. Uh, now I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, science with you guys um, to, to sort of justify nature-based solutions and, and why it's such a big opportunity uh, and why we love it so much in terms of mitigating climate impacts. The graph on the left is what is called a representative concentrated pathway of emissions. So we're somewhere in here, right? Well, actually now we're somewhere in here. This red line indicates business as usual. This is if we keep going, emitting, driving, consuming um, as a society, this is the uh, amount of emissions that, that we think will be emitted uh, to contribute to uh, a temperature spike of 3.2 to 5.4 C, not F. Remember we use Fahrenheit here. Uh, this blue line down here represents the, the, the commitments made to meet the Paris Agreement and keep us under 1.5 C. Um, these two are in the middle, obviously. Uh, latest research thinks that Thankfully, we're not going to hit this target. Uh, business as usual seems to be changing. Uh, and then we're not going to really hit Paris either. So we're going to end up somewhere in this range, but uh, no one's really sure where. There's a, a big statistical uh, bar, plus or minus, uh, but still a two to three, four degree C or a one and a half to three degree C. That's a lot. And, and in case you're not good with your math, like I'm not, um, I've given, excuse me, some conserva uh, some conversions down here that show what, what those degrees are in terms of impacts. Um, the, the cartoon uh, on the right is, uh, it sort of follows the represented comp, uh, concentrated pathways uh, graph on the left. Um, here again, you see the business as usual emissions. Uh, and, and the important takeaway here is literature shows, and this was a study done by uh, Nature Conservancy and a lot of other partners, and it was released in 2015, if we implement nature-based solutions to the global extent that we can, um, that can mitigate one-third of these emissions to help us meet the Paris Agreement uh, uh, obligations. Um, I'll get into those in a minute, what those are, but, but this is really interesting because the time is now. Right. If we can implement these by 2030, 2040, it makes a big difference 
as you can see, but the further along we go, the less impact and, and the, the lower percentage we're gonna have by using nature-based solutions. So right now it's about a third of potential mitigation opportunities, uh, but as we go further and further out and we don't in, uh, build these things or implement these nature-based solutions, they, they will become a smaller percentage of, of the overall pie, if you will. Um, okay, so what are those nature-based solutions? Same study, um, they're put into three categories, forests, agricultural and working lands, and wetlands. For our, our purposes today, we're gonna be talking about obviously the agricultural lands. Um, and then these bars on the right show uh, the low cost implementation potential for each of these 20 pathways, right? So there are things like putting biochar in your soil, probably not much uh, in practice right now, but, but they're showing that that worldwide has a, a great potential to sequester carbon. Uh, trees and cropland, right? Uh, nut trees interspersed with crops. Uh, nutrient management can make a big difference. Grazing and rotating your grazing uh, pastures can, can make a big difference. Conservation agriculture, all those things that I pointed to before, the no-till, uh, the cover crops, soil health initiatives, regenerative farming, right? That's what, what, what that talks about. And then it goes on and on into rice and grazing. Um, and then lastly, we have avoided grassland conversion. And, and for our, our purposes today, we're gonna think of that not as avoided grassland conversion, but avoided agricultural conversion into development um, in the context of this discussion. Okay, so further context, tensions and decisions. This is uh, the map on the left is a, a great CW graphic. It's a little old. But one of the reasons I really like this graphic in particular for today's discussions is it's one of the few graphics that actually shows the network of waterways in the Chicago region uh, area. And you will notice that here is Will County right here. And there are a number of rivers that run through that, right? That is a huge natural resource that, that when you look at land and, and all the other maps, you sort of might forget that they're there. Now, this uh, this graphic on the right um, is sort of a general overall graphic. So if we have uh, biophysical stressors, right? Things like temperature change, things like uh, flooding. Um, in red, we have resilient space that we're trying to create as, as a, a, a potential for a lot of uh, climate change solutions, right? Um, and then we have the social stressors, which is development, right? That's the sprawl that I referred to earlier on those maps. Now, just like the regionally concentrated or the representative concentrated pathways, we have a number of opportunities and decisions to make, right? In this case, business as usual is flipped and that line is at the bottom. So if we keep going this way, we end up with a globe that is very low resilience and very high risk for uh, natural disasters. And I think we're already starting to see that. But if we change our behaviors, right, we can mitigate that and, and change our world or our community or our county into one that is much higher resilience, which means that we can bounce back from natural disasters disasters or stressors much more quickly than we can if we have low resilience. And, and for that purposes, for those purposes, we're thinking about how we implement those nature-based solutions, right? So for ag, it's soil health, some of the practices that we've talked about. Um, but really in the context of today's discussion, it's how do we not develop our farmland, right? In the early 1900s, late 1800s, we plowed over the prairie to make farm. Now we're basically uh, enhancing that pattern by paving over the farmland that plowed over the prairies. A um, couple more slides here, so bear with me. So here's a, a wonderful image that Chicago Wilderness came up with. And, and you know I really like this image because it shows this very robust and rich web of green, if you will, that kind of weaves throughout the whole of the area. Again, we're somewhere down in here and you can see all those waterways that I referred to on that map. And that's really important because water is life and we really care about clean water 
and access to clean water. Um, you know, if you're in the downtown area or the metro area, you get your water from Lake Michigan. But somewhere around the the uh, divide line, you get your water from land and wells, right? Um, so that's one thing that I want to paint a picture for you for. This is a wonderful map. But the other thing I want to get everybody to think about here is we're essentially talking about land use today, right? Um, I want to flip that idea on its head. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and, and there was a whole discussion about um, involving Native Americans um, and indigenous tribes into conservation work. And, and the anecdote that was shared was they were trying to, to get a specific tribe. I don't remember which one, but, but they were like, hey, can you help us with our land use planning? We could, you know, you guys have such a great resource uh, of rich knowledge going way back in this area because you've always been here. This is, was one of the tribes that was not displaced. Uh, so I think that's West Coast, right? Maybe even Canadian. Um, and and the, the response was, well, we can't do that because we don't know what land use is. We know what land care is and we can help you with that. So in terms of this discussion, I want to change the language and the vision a little bit from land use to land care. As a landscape architect, I firmly believe that land use or land care needs to have multiple functions, right? It can't just be aesthetic anymore. It has to operate as a shading space or a cooling space or a, a flood reduction space to put water in the ground. Um, multiple uses, right? We can't get away with single uses anymore, in my humble opinion. Last thing I'm going to throw at you here is this is not a new concept, right? Our own Daniel Burnham from the late 1800s and early 1900s and the plan of Chicago had a very similar graphic, right? So even though we're still trying to build out this web of green, it's not new. And I want that to be a, a part of the context for today's conversation. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to, to Bob, uh, who will give you some more on the ground particulars surrounding the ag in this re in the Will County region. Bob, go ahead and share your screen if you want and take it away. Uh, thanks, Ted. Oh, where did my thing go? <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Uh, what? The... Here we go. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Um, let me go back, back to the top. So, yes. Yeah, so the um, so I am been very active in the Chicago Wilderness Alliance working with Agriculture Committee. And uh, really, I'm looking at this presentation. Uh, Laura says she's inviting uh, cafes on conservation success stories. And the conservation success story I want to talk about here is, is about the start of a conversation. So uh, as Ted explained that the history, CWA was all, always about the sort of the natural land advocates. And since the 2025 uh, vision, uh, Green Vision came together, we, we moved forward into engaging with the Working Land Partnerships and under the leadership of uh, Tim Brennan from the Farm Foundation and Daniel Suarez from Audubon, we've had very robust conversations about how there's a lot of conservation oriented practices that are going on. We don't, the farmers don't call them nature based solutions necessarily, but we're moving in that direction. And so the idea here with what we want to get going is, is how, how this, how this new, this emerging coalition of natural and working land constituencies can help lift up the Will County community, those members of the Will County community who, who want, who want to have a vision of, of, of the countryside next to suburbia, next to urban area, and, and, to, and to change what the American Farmland Trust says, there's a growth pattern that's happening right now where Will County is on course to lose more agriculture by 2040 than any other county in the United States outside of Maricopa uh, County, Arizona. So with that, um, let's first take a look at, uh, at the Will County um, whoops, sorry. At, um, so one of the things I've been involved with in, in, in my work down in Will County is the health department has, has a, uh, 
a collaborative where they work with the hospitals, the social service agencies, and I've been particularly interested in a food access group. And and it's uh, the, the dots on here refer to uh, micro and mobile food pantries. There's some food deserts over in Joliet. Uh, the Will County Farm Bureau uh, represents by and large, the row crop producers, but really everybody. And when they hear about, you know, the sort of the small scale neighborhood scale agriculture happening, communities feeding themselves, well, let's bring the buyers and the growers together. That's a natural impulse. We need those kind of connections. And there's also planning around community kitchens where, uh, and there's a, there's a, a $5 million funding need and they only have 800 grand to, so far. And I'm gonna come back to that, but also take a look at the map here. So over in the Western part, the, the, the most of the population of Will County is from uh, Naperville and Bolingbrook, Romeoville on down to the county seat in Joliet. And then over to the East here, Monee and Piatone, uh, that's where there's been the proposed airport site. And, and then also the Medewin Tallgrass Prairie. But uh, on the next slide, we'll zero in on what's happening in the Eastern Will County countryside. A couple of years ago, uh, a year ago, June, um, the CWA Ag Team, we visited a number of sites in, in, this, in this area of farmers uh, who were switching over from, uh, from conventional to organic production, direct market folks, also some, some good activity going on on forest preserve land to bring conservation into the, the part of it that's being used for agriculture. So what we're looking at here is Eastern Will County, the light blue is the is the proposal for this Piatone Airport when it was first brought forward in 1985 was to replace O'Hare with something three times the size of O'Hare. What's happened about 20 years ago, the state of Illinois, the dark blue area, they they uh, threatened condemnation and basically bought up seven square miles of farmland. And and what's happened just in the most current legislative session, there uh, the the a bill was brought to the governor. He did not ask for the bill, but the bill was brought to the governor to establish a. Uh, a request for proposals that IDOT's required to consider bringing in a cargo developer here. And now one last thing on this slide, this is Eastern Will County. It's kind of an orphan within the broader Will County community. As I mentioned earlier, most of the population is over in the Bolingbrook Joliet area, but here we're, it's, it's just south of Cook County, just, just west of, of Lake County, Indiana and Kankakee County. And so, um, what we have are there's three municipalities that surround the blue, uh, Moni, uh, Beecher, and Piatone. Those villages are all uh, in favor of an alternative plan. And that brings me to uh, Will County Board Chair Judy O'Gala, who's, uh, I see she's doubling up with some uh, grandkid care today. But as she said, when you know, that Governor Pritzker really needs to consider an alternative use plan for that seven square miles of land. And her vision is let's invest in local sustainable agriculture. Uh, let's, let's return the land of the private owners and the tax rolls. This land has been off of the property tax rolls for all these years when this property was just in uh, sort of sitting there. And there's some, there's treed land that should go over to the Will County Forest Preserve. And then there's, uh, then we need to be thinking about providing education, training, land access for young farmers. One of them who will be joining uh, Judy in, at the end of my presentation will be is Maria Abney. Uh, Ted referred to her earlier. She and her husband bought about five, six years ago, bought uh, 17 acres of land. This is uh, some of the sheep that they raise and visiting commingling with chickens. Um, and another person that, that I want to mention here is can't join the call today, but the, the uh, Ag Committee co-chair, Tim Brennan, he made a presentation to the Will County Board Executive Committee in June about let's work together on building an agri-food nutrition conservation research collaboration education center. Let's let's really present the governor with 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 a forward-looking vision about what how that land could be used in a way that's that's caring rather than just paving it over. And uh, Tim is also saying that uh, he's planning to put together an event that will build off some of the, the uh, discussion here. She's planning to have an event uh, working with the local, Tim, by the way, farms in, in Crete Township. Uh, and he's pulling together an event, that, a community planning event that's gonna take place in November sometime. More details on that to follow. Uh, this too, sorry about that. 
the um, going back, so so going back, ten, uh, um, Ted had referenced earlier those slides, the 1900, 1950, 1992. Take a look at the, the, the image on the left here. That was from an article I wrote for Illinois Issues Magazine in 1994. And uh, the dotted lines were really kind of the, the, the thinking at the time was, you know, as Ted had mentioned, you know, in the 19th century, the first developers plowed the prairies. The second, you know, th then in the 20th century, it's like pave over, create more suburbs. That was the definition of progress. And so with that in, in mind, they created this idea about they're going to build 75 miles of new toll roads. Those are the dotted lines. And the ones to the bottom would lead down to Piatone, where they were planning an airport two and a half times the size of O'Hare. They're going to replace O'Hare because then it just seemed that that was going to happen. In this, the middle slide here, uh, in um, 1996, I first took a look from a farming perspective. What, what would the options be? And at that time, well, geez, we've got the breadbasket of America. We, do we want to feed China or are we just going to continue to expand with suburbs? And of course, uh, as time has moved on, we now have... Um, the can't see the slide, but the uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> um, in 2009, I was uh, uh, I edited the final draft of a report to the General Assembly, uh, taking a look at organic food and farm, and it really established a whole set of uh, local food legislation that's moved forward. Most recently, in this last session, there was a bill that the that the governor signed that he did want to have, creating a 20 million dollar grocery uh, a fund to support community-based farming. There's a lot of other activity that came out of this most recent legislative session. There was a soil health initiative that's really going to help bring together agriculture and like the Illinois Environmental Council on a whole set of initiatives so that by 2040, I think there's going to be a whole policy framework that will, will help support what Ted was describing coming from, uh, coming from here in Illinois. Now, another aspect of this thing, when I got involved in this field 30 years ago, I was, again, I was thinking about the connection between urban disinvestment and suburban sprawl. Martin Luther King, when he, he came to Chicago to, to try to launch a national campaign to end, end uh, hunger and poverty, and that was in 1966, he took a ride out the Eisenhower Expressway. At that point, it was like six, seven years old to go give a speech at Elmhurst College. And I, shortly thereafter, he he made a he made a, he was meeting with Mayor Daly and them, and he was just very worried about how we were concentrating poor people over here, and then and opening the door for affluent for for white people to move away, and how the whole thing was set up in a way that was not really helpful for the overall growth of the health of the prosperity of everyone in the regional economy. And you see in the numbers that that the next twenty years we just services and infrastructure were stretched over ever greater distances, even though the population hadn't grown much. And the bottom quote here is, I think, kind of should guide a lot of our thinking from a political uh, political strategy perspective. I had, I had brought all this information to Governor Jim Edgar, and he said to me, we've got to figure out how to make places where, where more livable where people already are. We lessen the demand for suburban sprawl. And the best thing that I've seen for that uh, come, it was not at all going on when I was involved in the early 90s uh, with, uh, with the uh, transportation reform efforts, that there is now a nine-acre community redevelopment project going on in Auburn Gresham. They took a co contaminated waste site, and they have seven acres of, of farming. The, 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 the building here in the middle is an anaerobic digester that's con converting food. It's just beginning to convert food waste into organic fertilizer and natural gas. It's like a building block for the kind of circular economy that we, we need to have going forward. And, and Governor Pritzker provided some funding for that. And he said, you know, at the, at the, at the groundbreaking a couple of years ago, this is, this is a 21st century vision that deserves investment. And I think that's what we need to think about for, 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 uh, for the governor. And so this, the, the, the circle up here at the left top, that is, that is Auburn Gresham. They have community development corporations. They know how to raise money to support community redevelopment. Over here in Joliet, where there's like where they've identified this five million dollar community kitchen for around the the the, the county, 
they, they need to figure out how to learn how Auburn Gresham raised the money. And why not do so at the same time down here at Pembroke in the South? There's a, 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 a community of, of African-American farmers. And it's like, like Robin Kelly, um, Congresswoman Robin Kelly and Congressman Jackson were at an event down in Kankakee uh, on Monday with, with Secretary Vilsack from USDA. And I think, I think the way that we maximize an effective use of federal money and, and along with state policy is we'd be thinking about a food for all research triangle that brings the, the, the communities together around how do we create the places where we are more livable, starting with food and building around a, you know, a, a community uh, housing, et cetera, from there. And then in the middle, we have this seven square mile Piatone Airport site. And so again, just in, in closing, before I pass it on to Judy and Maria, um, so we, we have, the, the county has a land resource management plan that's in need of updating. And I think what Tim Brennan and, and that group is going to do at the me meeting next month is begin a visioning process about how do we connect up? We have this incredible natural resource of the tall grass prairie, and we've got all these working lands. And how can, how can we create a green belt that then will become, you know, and start the conversation there so that we're, we're carrying this throughout the entire Chicago wilderness uh, uh, region, especially at a time when we're going to be figuring out how to value renewable resources and, and capture the, the uh, like generate recurring revenue streams for farmers to support the kind of uh, climate uh, resilient economy we need going forward. So with that, uh, Ted, do you want to, you, you were going to introduce uh, Judy and Maria with the questions or? Oh, yeah, no. thanks, Bob. That was a, a really helpful presentation to give local on the ground context to sort of my higher level thinking and, and presentation. Uh, now we're going to sort of switch gears a little bit and, and I'm going to welcome both uh, Judy and Maria uh, and, and, and hopefully stir some good conversation here. Uh, first of all, ladies, among the many hats you wear are local farming, right? Uh, what do you think of this? What, how does this land with you both? Is this thoughtful? Is this you know, sound promising, or does this sound like pie in the sky uh, initiatives that that we're not really understanding what we need? So this is Judy O'Gala talking, and you know, I've been involved with this situation here out here in Eastern Will County for a long time, fighting against the airport. Hang on a minute. Of course, the phone's ringing at this second. <laughs> I can jump in as well. Yeah, go ahead, Maria. Uh, I'm Maria Abney. I am a local farmer. Um, as Bob introduced me earlier, we moved to the area about five and a half, six years ago. And so I'll have some comments to share, but I'm going to kick it back to Judy, if you can take it. Um, and I'll tell you about our farm story in just a moment. I'm currently at work, so I double as a financial advisor as well outside of the home and the farm, but I'll kick it back to Judy so she can continue. Thank you. So I became part of a, a group opposed to the airport a long time ago. And um, yes, I know. See that. Sorry if my grandson and granddaughter, she's napping, but he's awake too. So he's a chatterbox. But anyway, back at that time, my husband and I were fighting because we wanted to keep the land in the family. It's a family farm. We wanted to keep that in the family for a long time so that we could pass it on to our kids. We wanted our children to graduate high school and everything, never imagining that it would still be going on now our children have children. And so part of it, I cannot believe that phone is ringing again. Excuse me, I'm sorry. It never really rings, but of course it has. I'm sorry. So anyway, um, back in uh, 2010, I decided to run for office because I found myself always involved with uh, elected officials. And the one way to, to, to work on this is to get involved at the political level. And so that people, so that people understand um, <clears throat> You have to get in the room with the elected officials so they hear a different story. If it's just the people who are elected officials who keep pushing an airport and saying it's there for the jobs, you're not changing the conversation because no one else is having that conversation. So I got involved, 
I got elected to the county board in 2012. I'm currently the county board chair. And I've watched the change in the elected officials and their conversation about the airport. They've seen how this has really um, not gone anywhere, but it's impacting Will County because it impacts our residents and our community out here in Eastern Will County. So I think it's great we're having the conversation at the county board regarding it. And for a while, for a, for a while, hang on, I got a coffer. You okay? You want to stop here? Here, sorry, guys. No, you're fine. Here. This is a future planning discussion in sort of, <laughs> you know, for the next generation. For the next generation who is sick right now, but anyway, they'll be getting better soon. <laughs> I usually don't well, have, you know, I, I think this sort of illustrate the stressors that are on the community, right? There's a lot going on here right now and people are juggling a lot. And that's part of the conversation. Well, that's, that's, that's the thing that's true is that you have, um, you got to try and, you know, live your life, raise your family, go to work. And now I have my grandkids and this stuff continues, you know? So it's kind of it's kind of a difficult thing. Maria, and, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, yeah, to yeah. On, yeah. Um, so I can jump in as well. So I moved to the area about six, seven years ago now, coming up on seven years. Um, so we purchased a 16 and a quarter, almost 17 acre farmstead. Uh, it was in a greater farm uh, footprint of about 133 acres. This 133 acre farm had been in the same family since the late 1800s, which is very unusual, but this was what we purchased. Um, a lot of the lands that we purchased were put into the land conservation program. So they had been replanted with prairie grasses. And so we had access to this land now through this acquisition at the end of 2017 that had been kind of laid to rest for like the last 17, 18 years. So we felt extremely passionate about taking that land and being a good steward of this land. So we chose to go a little different route. We did not do any row crop, although there was row crop all around us. And then we also back up to the Raccoon Grove Forest Preserve. So we almost view ourselves as an extension of the Forest Preserve and in getting this wonderful opportunity to be a steward of this land that's been so nicely preserved for the last 17 years with no row crop, no GMO, no, no pesticides and herbicides, we decided we were going to continue that um, organic um, kind of working with the earth and living with the earth approach. So what we did was we cleared a lot of the prairie grass um, we kept it in some areas. We have not taken any of the mature trees. We own a tree line that um, that borders a creek. I believe it's called Walnut Creek or Rock Creek right there. And uh, we've kept everything the way it is. We've put in four different pastures that we've laid all by hand ourselves. And we do pasture rotation grazing. And we have a flock of sheep and we have several beef cattle and then we have chickens. And so we do sustainable practices. We do pasture rotation. Um, we rotate our, our all of our livestock on the land. We do our own composting. We put down a garden patch every year that's about an acre and a half or so in size. And then we actually grow non-genetically non modified all heirloom seed um, produce. And then I sell this in the community. So not only am I a financial advisor at Edward Jones in Crete, I actually deliver food to people's houses. Sometimes people are in need and I just give it to them. Sometimes I sell it to help recoup some of my costs, help defray some of that cost. But um, I widely advertise, you know, my produce, I do this on the weekends and after hours and early in the morning before I come to work. So you know, wear a lot of hats and um, go to farmers markets, things like that on the weekends. But my and my husband's goal is to put good quality food out into the community because we are in a food desert. In Moni, we have no grocery store. We have a grocery store in Piatone. We have a grocery store in Crete. We have Walmart in Richland Park. 
but in this several mile area, it's it's the talk of the town. It's it's on every <laughs> social media Facebook page. When are we gonna get a grocery store? So what we try to do is put produce out there, put eggs that we have from our sheep or chickens that are you know free ranging. And that's our little contribution. If we could make it larger, if we could offer more things, you know, or you know, have an effective distribution point, you know, that'd be great. We're planning on building a little farm stand at the end of our driveway um, and and putting sort of an honor box out there during the summertime. That'll probably be next year. Um, but to to date, this is what I do. I am financial advisor by day, food runner on the weekends. Um, People come, they make arrangements, they come to my home, they come to our farm, I'll deliver food to them. Um, and it's it's really a joy. It's a joy to not only produce great food, real foods, whole foods for my family that we can consume, but then to take that surplus and put it out into the community. There's just something incredibly satisfying about being able to do that and share that with others. And again, just being a good steward of the land. So that's really you know, what, what we're trying to do as small farmers. And um, we're not the only ones. We are also homeschoolers. And in our homeschooling group, there's about seven or eight other families that all want to do the same thing. They all want to buy a homestead. They all want to produce their own food or be somewhat self-sufficient or put good food out there for their friends and their community. So I'm not the only person. This is a growing, um, I think, desire and a growing realization that there are food supply issues. We saw that during COVID. We saw supply chain issues and lingering issues. And I can talk about that, expound on that from a financial and economical standpoint for a whole other conversation. But this is real. This is happening. This, this going into the grocery store and finding everything you could possibly want, it's not sustainable. Uh, we really do need to get back to the idea of growing a little glory garden in our backyard and having something for ourselves and for our neighbors um, because we just cannot afford to lose the farmland and think that we're still going to be able to feed everybody, right? So again, that's that's really our goal is to put good food out there, provide it for our friends, our neighbors, uh, people that we get to meet through this and um, just share what, what we have, the abundance that we have. And this will be taken away. Um, I am in the footprint and that would end. I, I have a whole host of questions. I want other people to get a chance. There's some stuff in the chat. I, I'm gonna ask one last quick question and I'm gonna try to combine it with Cynthia's question about food co-ops. And my question is, you know, you talked about eggs and vegetables. That's all pretty easy to distribute, but you also have beef cows, right? How do you deal with larger animals? And is there infrastructure for that to Cynthia's point? Like we're talking about partnerships here. What What is the need and, and how could this idea of land care and, and an alternate land use plan that's based on agriculture sort of build on those needs and, and help you both in terms of the larger sort of commodity production uh, and, and size of animals that you have? So if I could jump in, Maria, um, one of the things that we learned through COVID was uh, I have friends who have, have beef cattle, they have pigs, chickens, all that need to go for processing. But with COVID, it shut it all down. So one of the things that I learned was we need local processing so we can have a sustainable food source right here. I agree. I would tell you that um, we actually process our own sheep. My, we've purchased, um, you know, meat, you know, processing equipment. However, when it comes to cattle, um, I can tell you I have two beef cattle that for the last two and a half years, I cannot process them because I don't have a trailer to take them and the nearest place that I'm aware of that will process small volume. So there's a difference between somebody like me who has two or three or five cattle versus the average meat packing. Most average meat packers that are large scale, they will not even deal with me. If I don't have, you know, 20, 50 head of cattle that I'm bringing in there. Not worth their the time. Won't even open. And so I've uh, lovingly cared for these couple of cattle, not because they're pets, 
but rather because I have no way to process them? Um, I think those are great answers. Like I said, I have a whole slew of questions, but I do want to open this up to the audience. If if anybody has uh, something that, that is on their mind or they want to ask, please go ahead. Um, and if not, I'll continue with my list of questions. Um, I'd like to um, contribute something as well. Um, so my name is Julie Berkowitz. I'm a Will County board member um, with Judy and Dan. And um, I love uh, learning about your organization because I also have a home in Michigan. Um, my father's family, both sides of the family, have been farmers since the 1600s. And I have a small parcel of land that was my grandfather's farmland in Byron Center, which is right next to Grand Rapids. And um, <clears throat> in my district, I'm in the Naperville. My district has Naperville, Aurora, Plainfield, and Oswego addresses. And there have been two parcels in my district that I have tried to find a way to preserve and have run into a brick, a brick wall in every direction. Um, part of this is because the nonprofits that are out there have their own criteria and they're not interested in preserving a parcel if they think it's too small or isn't in the area they're concentrating on. And that's been a major um, roadblock. And <clears throat> One of the things I'm trying to do is there's an eight acre parcel of beautiful land in my district. The homeowner wants the land preserved, but he also is having a hard time affording the taxes here. But I haven't found a way to help him achieve that goal. And I approached the Forest Preserve, I approached the city of Naperville, I approached uh, the Conservation Foundation and a number of other organizations and they're in the park district and there wasn't even a way to get an intergovernment agreement. So <clears throat> I think, you know, as an elected official and working with other forms of government, I think that we need to make sure we build a strong activist base and and, and ethic. uh, ethics, but also um, a chain of command um, power that isn't ingrained with politics and government because government can sometimes provide, you know, that, that wall there. So Julie, I don't mean to cut you off, but I'm monitoring the chat and okay. Taryn F from the Conservation Foundation chatted. Okay. Let's have a conversation. I'd sure. love to connect you to some of the broader agricultural supports. So yeah, I'd love win -win. to follow up with that. But that's the one thing I wanted to um, mention is if if we can identify, we're we have a small window of time to identify those particular parcels. And, and that's what I've been trying to do in my district. And, and, and not to cut you off, but Chicago Wilderness is also looking at land protection writ large. So that's part of this conversation too. Go ahead, Judy. Right. I just wanted to say, so um, <clears throat> one of the processing plants uh, that's actually a butcher, that local farmers who have, you know, they don't have a, like many head of, of beef or pigs or whatever, they go to Shinoa. Chenoa, Illinois is a one hour and 24 minute or 80, 81 miles from my house. And I live um, between Moni and Piatone in the country. So that's, and that's close to take your meat. They were taking what? it three, four years, three, 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 three to four months in the future. Hang on a minute, P. Three to four months in the future during COVID and they had to go to Southern Illinois. So this one's close at 81 miles. So local meat processing, Small facility would be fabulous. Even if the a lot of the farmers, they know how to process their own animals. They do it for themselves, but it would be nice if they could process it locally and sell it locally. 
Same thing with chickens. People do have eggs. That's easy. But we do have chickens that people do process and, and you have to go so far. And there are a lot of restrictions from um, the county health department. So we need to get some changes made there. But if we start this conversation and get some real traction going to say we can't live keep living the way we have in the past, we have to change for the future. And the future is looking at and maintaining our ag land, keeping it, having a local sustainable food source, putting in conservation practices that benefit everybody. Um, we're running out of time. I'm happy to stay on for a couple minutes late if other people are willing to. I show of hands from the panelists. You got five extra minutes or so, 10 maybe. Um, okay, a couple more things from the chat that I wanna try to weave together. Um, there's been the, the mention of a co-op. Uh, there's been mention of shared services in terms of trailering, right? Can, can you uh, share? It, it, are there possible to share items and, and services? And then the last uh, one that I want to weave into this or try to weave into this is how, how does that information exchange take place, especially in terms of trailer needs or equipment needs or nature-based solutions practices, which is what the question was from Brett. Um, it, I assume that's a peer-to-peer -peer network, but if you're isolated or new to the community, that's pretty tough. H how does that take place uh, in your experience? I will say, my, oh, oh, go ahead. I, I have these two cattle right now I need to process and it's going to be embarrassing. I'm going to call the people that sold them to me and say, listen, I know you have a cattle trailer. Uh, remember those cows you sold me almost three years ago? Could you come and can I hire you? Because I, I don't have a ten or $15,000 cattle rig right now at my disposal. You know, um, could you come and get these cattle and take them to Chino Locker? I already called uh, last weekend. Uh, they're they're able to process a couple of cattle, it's no problem, but I have to call these people, right? And then I can't expect they're gonna do this. So I've got to give them some, whatever they they want from me until I can afford to buy my own cattle trailer uh, or horse trailer or whatever that's suitable. So that's my situation. I don't know anybody that has a cattle trailer, um, but I would be willing to hire someone. Um, again, probably gonna go back to the people that sold me my cows and they're gonna be shocked. <laughs> Judy? Yes, yeah, so I would think, um, so Maria is part of a very new group of farmers out here, small little, like a little farm at the large farmers who do a lot of row crop um, and have animals as well. They have the ability to do that. So it's possible that you could make that arrangement with them. Maria doesn't happen to know them. I know some of the people and a, a lot of things that happen, people do on social media. So I think that's a, a way of connecting. But if you get the conversation out there, we have a great local um, reporter that's a local, little local paper. We could do something locally, but it would be bigger than just my small area. So Tara Neff is chiming in. Uh, have, do either of you, are you aware of the Will County Farm Network? Um, and if not, she would love to talk to you about it because that might be a connection point for trailer or some of the infrastructure needs you guys are talking about. I'm, I'm not aware, but certainly open. Okay. Uh, so Tara, how, how do you want to, I, I can pass along Maria's contact to you if you want, if that's the easiest way, or maybe you guys can switch it in chat. Um, there are a couple other comments, uh, one from somebody named R.A., I'm not sure who that is, but uh, they're chiming in about, are there any thoughts on an, an industrial issues such as warehousing? And then the follow-up comment by John is, um, adding to R.A.'s comment, we're being flanked on the West by thousands of acres in Center Point and North Point warehouses in the SSA proposal on the East with tens of thousands of acres. The entire county's quality of life will suffer for all the residents, farmers, et cetera. So, you know, what I'm hearing out of this conversation is not only a need for infrastructure and shared infrastructure opportunities, but, but also these development pressures that we were talking about um, and, and the partnerships, right? We, we've identified a couple partnerships. I think there needs to be more. And, and this is part of that discussion to help elevate these issues to, to keep this rural quality of life that, that people love and really depend on, right? And, and to, to create a sustainable economy. Um, Shibu asks, are you working with your local Illinois Extension offices? 
Uh, how could they be more of help with nature-based climate solutions, uh, maybe education or resources? Um, feel free to email me your thoughts or ideas. Uh, it sounds like Shibu is from an extension office. Um, did I get that right, Shibu? You want to chime in here? Yes, uh, that is correct. So I, hello everyone. I am uh, the program leader for our natural resources, environment, and energy program, based out of Urbana Champion Campus here. So I can oversee our uh, extensions, natural resources program, including energy and um, environmental programming. So yeah, I would be uh, uh, curious to know if there is any uh, uh, help that being provided you know, in terms of the education and you know, resources from the local extension offices, or if you have other thoughts and ideas in terms of the partnerships or collaboration, I think I would be, uh, yeah, that's why I put my email there. If you are if you have anything to share, feel free to send me an email. Thank you. I would say Thank YouTube's you. been my best friend. <laughs> so that's in my DIY, brain. right? Any DIY is best friend. <laughs> YouTube, yeah, that's, um, that's I think, the, the biggest resource and that has been always available 24-7 to me. But I'm just not aware of anything. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, when you buy a farm, there's no owner's manual, um, but there's plenty of work to be done. <laughs> it also sounds like maybe there's an opportunity uh, as part of the ag community to make some of these connections, right? I don't know if it's a database or a contact list, uh, but that sounds like that would be helpful to me as part of this uh, next steps in, in this discussion um, as part of the land alternate land use planning that this group hopes, ha, hopes pardon me, to undertake. Um, we are about at 105. Uh, I, I do wanna respect people's times. Are there any last uh, statements from the panelists or one last question? Bob, I see you have your hand raised. I'm gonna defer to the ladies first uh, because that's how my mother raised me. Um, go ahead, ladies. <laughs> Okay, so I will I will close mine. Sorry, I had the grandkids today. That was not my plan, but um, I think that the conversation is changing. We have a lot of people who are elected who are willing to listen, um, but it need we need people from the general public to step forward and bring ideas to them. So it's just not one person talking. And um, I just remind everyone, you know, as as with with the aftermath of COVID, we learned that we need to have local sustainable food, which makes sense. So therefore I proposed, you know, taking the land purchased by the airport, the treat area should go to the forest preserve. They should sell a lot of the farmland back to farmers. But then also we need to look at what could we do for educating young farmers, getting people involved so that they can understand um, conservation practices in both a specialty crop or a um, row crop. So, I'm hoping we can continue moving forward and help uh, help each other out. Thank you. Sorry Thank for the you. interruptions. No uh, worries. Maria. Just, um, no, I, I'm looking forward to getting some connection to resources. Uh, Mark, on my husband and my side, both of our grandparents on all sides, you know, were farmers. Our parents were not. We are. So I think that just speaks to how, you know, things, trends kind of come around and there's nothing new under the sun. So we are just embracing this farming way of life. And um, we are somewhat novices, but I think it's very bold to step forward and try to do this. Um, and it's not easy. So believe me, it, it, it's um, it's not for the faint hearted. You, you really have to be passionate about it. We are. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to more resource connections and um like I said, I really feel like there's an opportunity also from my side. I see a lot of young people that want to do things like what we're doing, but they don't have the capital. So if there is some sort of path to ownership or path to equity, I think that that would be really compelling for a lot of folks that are looking for job opportunities or career opportunities to know maybe they could have some kind of equity or ability to build equity in an agricultural um, setting. I don't know what that looks like, but it's just a, a thought that I'm throwing out there. But uh, again, I think that's just um, something to, to think about to help embrace the youth and the next generation of farmers. Thank you, Bob. You had your hand for a, a last comment. Yeah. To, yes. To, to Judy's point about the fact that there are now elected officials that are willing to listen and we need to get 
We need to get uh, a lot of different voices in front of those folks. So I think it's really important. Uh, Tim Brennan is going to, there's going to be a community meeting in early November. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 the idea that the elected officials that are willing to listen, you have three municipalities in Eastern Will County, Piatone, Beecher, and Moni that want to support an alternative plan. And then over in the West, the uh, Elwood and Manhattan, who are right around all the, all the container, the, the, the uh, container activity, they are as well. And that could, that could be the nucleus. So between uh, the, 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 the public, the public meeting that's going to be organized in Eastern Will County, and then also reporting uh, back to the December meeting of the growing with ag committee. So we just keep this conversation going and make sure that uh, the governor has an alternative plan to present to, to consider as well. So I just want to thank everyone. This has been really exciting. I've, Judy and I have been involved in this effort for many, many years and the sort of the, the, the power that's that's taking root here around a broader vision with the climate plan for people in nature is wonderful. With that, I want to thank all the participants, uh, the panelists, the presenters and, and the audience. Um, thank you for staying 10 minutes late hanging in there with us. Uh, really nice, rich discussion like I had hoped. Uh, and I will release you all to get on your day with many thanks and much hope and, and much desire for success and love. Uh, thank, thank you. you Ted. <laughs> thank you. You're an excellent moderator today. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.